This time on Standard Bread. A bona fide equine champion of world harness racing takes his leave. Good boy. Good boy. As one of the Standard Bread world's brightest stars steps away, the man responsible for creating him gets an introduction. Incredibly proud to be the breeder. Incredibly proud. Standard Bread is supported by a stable of key players in the New Zealand Standard Bread breeding and racing industries. Good boy. Good boy. It's Good boy. slightly ironic as Christian Cullen takes his leave from centre stage, the man more than partly responsible for infusing one of the Standard Bread world's brightest equine stars, finally gets an introduction. I'm not an artist and I'm not any good building anything with my hands. You know, I tried to make a pencil case and woodwork and failed. Um, but I found a little bit of art in being able to breed something. But he's done it there, now he's done it here. Hail the new Australasian champion, Christian Cullen. He won the Miracle Mile by 20 metres. Paul Bealby is reluctant for much to be read into his absence from a champion of champions career. I'd had um, a number of changes in my life, um, personal and, and professional. And um, I was probably um, more concentrating on rebuilding a few aspects of my life at that stage rather than, um, than the pursuits of my hobbies. There's an acknowledgement he did breed his premier broodmare, Pleasant Franco, to an exciting yet unproven stallion in the pocket back in 1993. And that fusion did result in a racehorse fans couldn't see enough of, who media couldn't talk or write enough about, and almost inevitably, controversy couldn't keep far from. <laughs> There's a little bit of confusion there. I retained 25% in the initial sale and purchase. Later, prior to um, Christian Cullen racing, um, I did have to sell the balance. While accepting his crucial bit in launching the legendary Christian Cullen, Paul Bealby insists it's something he can't really take much credit for. I, I would love to tell you that there's a formula and it's, you know, it's like the KFC secret spices that are in a vault somewhere. But no, there isn't. So where does this version of the story as yet untold begin? A friend of mine at school invited me to the trots. Never had set foot on a race course before in my life. Um, and assured me it was going to be a fun night. So we went along and, um, and it was, it was a great night. However, uh, in terms of uh, the investment side of things, it was a very poor night. I didn't have a collect all night. And I remember um, getting to the last race and having not had a collect, deciding that I was going to make sure I did have one. And I, I backed about 10 horses in a 13 horse field and still managed to um, miss a dividend. I distinctly remember going home that evening in the car with an empty wallet thinking I didn't make any money there tonight but there were a lot of people that did in some capacity and and it it sort of came to me pretty quickly that it was the people that were involved in the horses and they were racing the horses and were breeding the horses and um, um, I, I suppose I was bit by the bug very very quickly uh, in terms of the atmosphere um, I've never been uh, a massive or a significant punter uh, don't mind a bit, but it, it hasn't been something that um, I've had to do. Um, but I was always interested in being in, in, in the racing atmosphere. At, at the time, were you at Varsity, or what were you doing? No, no, I was working, and in fact, that um, at a later stage, it was almost um, by coincidence, I started working uh, for an insurance broker who was specialising in bloodstock insurance. Uh, and so there became another reason for the paths to cross um, and at that stage um, I was involved in, in uh, servicing one client in particular which was National Bloodstock and, and um, they in turn obviously had an impact at that time on the on the standard bread industry. So what was your first try? <laughs> Ironically the first broodmare I bought was a mare called Keep Trying 
um, and um, she was, um, uh, I asked um, a young Kyle Salinger who had been previously working for Pines as an auctioneer um, to go to the mixed stock sale in Christchurch for me and I gave him a list of three or four mares and, um, and I gave him a budget and I think he thought I was quite mad um, because the budget was so insignificant. Um, but he, he rang me sometime after the sale and said you were successful in purchasing this mare and, um, and that was the first one, keep trying, yeah. Um, so she was a half sister to our mana and I think I, in my own little world at that stage realised that as much black type on the page as you could get for as little investment as possible was probably a good result. Um, she was in foal at the time to Michael Jonathan who was a full brother to Holmes Hanover and, and I was absolutely sure that he was going to be just as successful as Holmes Hanover and obviously that was one of the many um, incorrect sureties I had. I bred from memory three foals out of her and, and um, I think they all qualified. I think one 1A race and, and, and one, one two or three or four. Um, and then I sold her um, and began a, a sort of a, a magpie-ish collection of mares trying to get as many as possible without realising that that was the easy part and the hard part was going to be paying for them. So your best first horse was that you bred? Uh, the, the most commercially um, successful horses I bred initially were, were the two fillies I took to um, the sales in the same year which was Kate's First and Scent. And, um, um, by some uh, immaculate stroke of fortune they both proved to be Oaks winners um, and um, both from, from totally different um, situations but uh, both, both Holmes Hanover fillies and I think at that stage I'd realised that if you wanted to be successful you had to follow the old adage of, of um, breeding the best you could afford to the best stallion you could afford and, and Holmes was the leading sire or one of the leading sires at the time. Like to know more about racing or breeding standard breeds? Find the New Zealand Standard Bred Breeders on Facebook or go to the Breeders website. Standard Bread is supported by a stable of key players in the New Zealand standard bread breeding and racing industries. Rather than keep trying to reinvent the breed with his own shallow theories, Paul Bilby's instinct was to upgrade the commercial viability of his small broodmare band as quickly as he could afford. So how did Pleasant Franco come about? What were the whys and wherefores for purchasing her? particularly? Yeah, it, um, I'd love to say there was a master plan, Sheldon, but there wasn't, uh, other than, again, I knew to become more commercial uh, in terms of having a product to sell, I needed to have more commercial mares, and the yardstick at the time was being a, a black type mare. So I um, uh, tried and looked for a black type mare to buy, and she was advertised in the Harness Racing Weekly. Assistance and advice always his cornerstone, Paul and his Christchurch accommodator and friend Brad McDonald paid a visit to a then in foal with Kate's first Pleasant Franco. He purchased confidently on what they saw. So expensive or still budget? Um, well at the time I think a, a few people thought she was expensive. Um, and probably she was the most expensive mare that I'd bought. Um, but I, you know, in hindsight, she was cheap. So, so you weren't backing yourself into any corners at that stage. You didn't think? No, no, I didn't think so. Um, uh, I had the ability to to um, collect more mares than I needed, um, and and that's because you can see if you look hard enough, good in any potential mare. Um, so I had probably um, more mares than I needed to have, although um, the numbers um, weren't an issue in terms of um, the breeding, the breeding uh, hobby, because that's what it was. 
And in fact, it wasn't until much later when um, when I had a, a, a couple of um, changes in my work scenario and my business scenario that it began to um, it came to realization pretty quickly that um, um, there needed to be a better income than I had at the time to support them. Without knowing what her first foal had in store, this keen new breeder began scouting stallion talent for his first fully commercial commodity and kept coming back to an American import, the quality of which had never landed in this part of the world before. I was really um, uh, enamoured by In the Pocket as a sire, full stop. Um, but for some reason I think um, I, I was pretty keen on the direct scooter line as an outcross to the, the entrenched meadow skipper line in New Zealand that we've had for almost you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, and um, he represented something as, as, as an exciting new opportunity, yeah. So you bred this what, spectacular foal or how did it, Matt? Yes, um, I did in fact, I was still living in Auckland at the time um, and, and the foal was born here on David's property uh, and David was pretty quick to tell me that the foal was, um, was a very nice type, very nice individual. So. Um, Foals can change rapidly, um, but the horse uh, had, had um, X Factor from early days, yeah. So in terms of your life going pear-shaped for one of a, where were you at that stage when the foal was on the ground? Were you in cell mode at that point or? No, no. Um, in fact, uh, things were just um, business as usual at that time and, um, and out of the blue, um, I was approached by David um, to say that he had been approached by somebody who wanted to buy the, the weanling. Numbers were discussed and I said well I'll, I'm, I'm happy to do that because it is a business about selling and moving on to the next one but I also um, had heard enough from David to realise that this horse you know, m may have been quite um, a nice type and um, agreed that I would retain a 25% share in the horse at that time. So who was offering the money? Uh, Brian O'Meara um, was, was the purchaser, yeah. So just for the record, you didn't sell major shareholding in Christian Cullen or Stein James as he was known then because you had to, because you, you were short of money and you desperately no, had to sell. No, um, no you, there's a little bit of confusion there. I retained 25% in the initial sale and purchase. Later, prior to um, Christian Cullen racing, um, I did have to sell the balance. Um, I was made an offer. Um, I was struggling to, to meet my financial commitments with the horses. Um, I was struggling to pay the bills. Um, and, and I make no secret of that. It was, it was a tough time. I had no income, basically. Um, and so I was um, asked if I would like to sell the remaining 25% that I held. Um, and again, I nominated a price and it was accepted. So what was going wrong? Yeah, I, I had a, um, a business and um, I unfortunately, um, again in hindsight probably through poor management rather than, than um, any other aspect, um, inherited a pretty big bad debt. Um, and that put paid to a lot of the business operations. So where were you when all the Christian Cullen drama started unfolding? I say drama in terms of, you know, the spectacular rise of this almost never seen before or really seen before horse. You were never really on the radar then. Did you walk away from it totally? Did you just shut it off? No, no. In fact, um, I still had um, an ownership of Kate's First, um, a, a quarter share in Kate's First at that time. Um, and in fact... We raced against Christian Cullen um, in the Cup uh, after Kate's first had won the Auckland Cup. Um, so no, I, I, I was aware of his success. I, I don't think regret is probably the right word. I think um, there was a, a fair bit of pride that this horse was doing so well. Um, and at that stage, uh, I still owned a share in the the dam, so that was great for her commercially. Um, 
I think I was resigned to the fact at that stage that I didn't have a choice um, and I had uh, put a price on the horse to sell it and it had been accepted. Um, and that's, you know, those are decisions that you have to stand by and if you, if you live your life looking in the rear vision mirror, well, you won't get very far. How long did you cling on with Kate's first and Pleasant Franco during that? Um, well, basically until Kate's first retirement. Um, and then she was sold, um, and the mother was sold, um, Pleasant Franco, and and uh, this was to keep you afloat or keep well, the wolves Well, my, my my share of those proceeds basically cleared the debts I had with horses. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I certainly didn't um, uh, walk away with with any great pockets full. To join the harness racing and breeding conversation, you can make contact with your standard bred breeders associations across New Zealand. At David Shadbolt's Broadfield Lodge, just out of Christchurch, Paul Bealby ponders his future prospect, Smiley Sophie, happy in almost the same paddock where Pleasant Franco fold down champion Christian Cullen, world-class filly Kate's first, and several famously named, but not quite as good, other folds. People like David, who had held my hand through some pretty tough times, um, and, and David wasn't in a position to be my banker, but had, um, probably through necessity, more than anything, um, continued to stand by me. Um, that was when he, he was able to be settled and, and debt cleared. So by standby, what do you mean? Well, I don't think I, um, at that point in, in my life, was paying my bills on time. I didn't have the funds to. Um, so uh, da David continued to adjust my horses and, and look after them in, in a, uh, a wonderful manner, as he always has, um, without always being paid on the 20th of the month. In the cut and thrust of business slash horse racing, did everyone do that? Uh, with regard to myself, um, I think most people are generally pretty understanding. Uh, uh, most people are, are, are not wanting to um, um, to cut off a potential source of income if you are, a, a, you know, a, a breeder or an owner. But also, a lot of people had to be realistic at the time and, and say, well, uh, if we're not getting paid, well, then what are the prospects of us getting paid? So, I, I know I think I was treated pretty fairly. Um, and especially, you know, at that stage I didn't have a lot of horses left, so. You know, for most people, Christian Cunnan will be the galaxy of stars and the miracle miles and what have you. Did did you get the, you know, the punch in the ear moments when you were watching those, like, just sheer No, and, 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 and uh, although I was aware of, of his continued success, I must admit that um, I wasn't following the sport closely at that time. Um, I'd had... Um, a number of changes in my life, um, personal and, and professional, and um, I was probably um, more concentrating on rebuilding a few aspects of my life at that stage rather than um, than the pursuits of my hobbies. Um, so uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a, about it being painful to watch or anything like that. It just wasn't prioritised for me at that time. Being in the background trying to bring his life back on track doesn't mean Paul Bealby hasn't taken time to reflect on his reluctantly accepted achievement. Incredibly proud to be the breeder, incredibly proud. Um, and I think it's, it's one of those um, situations where his success and the extent of his um, footprint on the industry was, was not known in the early stages of, of my involvement with the horse, and it only became apparent as his career unfolded. Um, and you've, you've got to also separate his racing career from his stud career. So um, the fact that he was an incredibly successful racehorse didn't um, automatically mean that he was going to be a successful sire. And the fact that he was such a successful sire, um, well, that, that just, um, you know, topped it off in, in terms of being a part of that story, yeah. Is there any sort of rhyme and reason for your breeding success, you think, or is it just down to logic? 
bit of luck. Yes, I, I, I would love to tell you that there's a formula and it's, you know, it's like the KFC secret spices that are in a vault somewhere. But no, there isn't. Um, I always followed the, the early advice of, of to breed the best buy the most or the best you can afford and then breed to the best you can afford. Um, I always liked the theory of outcrossing, um, but I'm not Robinson Crusoe there. I'm, I was following trends that were set in place long before I came along. So, unfortunately not, Sheldon. What have you learned in the last, how long is it, 20 years breeding? What have you learned about it? Um, not to take anything for granted, um, to be patient, um, and probably to look more at your project or your or your breeding um, decisions through the eyes of the potential buyers, as opposed to what you necessarily think is the best option for your mare. Um, that does take away some of that artistic license that you may feel in deciding that you'd like to breed your mare to a specific stallion because you've got a you've got an inkling that the resultant progeny may may be um, very successful. But if you are breeding purely from a commercial standpoint, um, I think you have to sacrifice some of that sometimes until you get into a position where the broodmare herself is commercial and then you can take a few of those. I was going to say, is there room for the artist to come out in this day and age or is it just flat out commercial, even from your perspective? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think there's always going to be room for the artist to come out if they are not um, bound commercially to the result. Um, and, and fortunately, there are still a number of breeders out there who are not breeding purely to sell. And they're breeding because they have a passion to breed and they have a, a, um, a mare that they believe in and an idea they believe in. And so that, that will continue to happen. By good luck or good management, thanks to advice or some commercial common sense and lessons along the way, Paul Bealby has achieved already what most standard bred breeders strive for in a lifetime. Can you actually have any ambitions it's it's, going forward? Yeah, that, that's, that's crossed my mind many times. It's a pretty um, hard um, task to replicate. And um, I think that's also part of the challenge though, that if you are able to, to do it once, well then um, you strive to, to do it again. Um, but not necessarily, um, it, I wouldn't say that I strive to repeat that success um, because I'm really happy if a horse I breed wins a maiden race. So you're still there? I, I, I still love the fact that I've had an input into the creation of a successful racehorse. Um, and it, it's a thrill. I, I, I cheer just as loudly for the horses that are racing that I bred and sold as yearlings um, as the one that I may retain a share in. Um, I do get the same buzz. You've been a better horse since Christian Killen? Oh, I'm not the person to ask that. No, no just in your gut. Um, records get broken every year. Um, so if, if you're saying technically has there been a better horse, perhaps. Um, it's a pretty good horse though. Next time on Standard Bread. In 2015, the Auckland Trotting Club, now surrounded by big city hubbub, embarked on an urban living and retail project that could put the ATC at the head of a battling horse racing pack. 
I'm a very optimistic person, I'm a very positive person, so my thing is go big or go home because we didn't have a lot of choices to us. It's a, it's a lifeline on the one hand and a death kneel on the other, isn't it? Like?